Hey guys, Matsmas here. Thank you so much for joining me today on this video. So today's video is a little special because this vehicle that I'm reviewing and going to give my opinion on is hands down my favorite armored fighting vehicle in the world. Now, the Warrior Infantry Fighting Vehicle, otherwise known as the MCV-80, is an absolutely fantastic piece of equipment. Now, I can relate to this vehicle personally and with experience because I pretty much know this vehicle inside and out. I've operated with it in the British Army on multiple occasions, pretty much most of my career, other than working with the Crafts and Challenger 2s and such. And it's just an absolutely fantastic piece of equipment. Now I'm going to go over its key features and the overview of the vehicle in general first and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of touch base on why I feel this vehicle is so good and kind of my personal, um, I guess, experiences with the vehicle and how I, how I worked with it, how I operated with it and then we'll probably even go over some more in-depth features that you may not quite know about this vehicle and a lot of people may not know um, because they've just not been around the vehicle as such. We're actually going to kind of go over the different... Uh, parts of the vehicle, maybe even different uh, areas that you may have not seen before, and just to kind of give you an, a, an insight to this fantastic infantry fighting vehicle. So uh, let's start off with a quick overview then and go from there. The definition of warrior in the dictionary is, especially in former times, a brave or experienced soldier or fighter, which is quite befitting for the name of this vehicle as it was developed in the mid-1970s by GKN Sankey. That has seen action in Operation Desert Storm, Bosnia, Kosovo on peacekeeping duties and in 2003 the invasion of Iraq as in the summer of 2007 and has also deployed in Afghanistan. It has earned its name as The Warrior. In October 2011 Lockheed Martin UK won the Warrior Capability Sustainment Program contract after the MOD secured a £1 billion funding program for the upgrades to keep this Warrior in service until 2040 which is so cool. I'm so glad they're not scrapping it. I'm glad they're keeping it rolling and upgrading it with some key features that it's going to require really to keep up with the modern day battlefield. Several hundred warriors will be upgraded. So let's just talk about its development then. The Ministry of Defense started to make proposals for their future APC requirement from 1967 until 1971. GKN was selected to undertake competitive studies and subsequently won the bidding for the contract in 1976 and production began in 1979 where it was called the MCV-80. It had to meet several criteria. Firstly, it had to have the capacity for 10 infantrymen from the British Army which were to include the crew and their equipment. Secondly, it had to be able to match the speed of the newly appointed British Army main battle tank Challenger 1 which we all know is pretty speedy off-road. Thirdly, its protection had to be strong enough to withstand indirect artillery, handheld rockets and small arms fire. It also had to be versatile in jobs that it could use, be used for such as support maintenance vehicle or air defence creating its own family of different variations of this vehicle which we'll discuss a little later on. In 1984, GKN had completed its contractual obligation and produced 12 MCV-80s, four of which participated in exercise Lionheart in Germany to see if they could match the speed of the Challenger 1s. And in the same year, the British Army welcomed the MCV-80 into service. There, it was renamed the Warrior. Initial orders for the MOD for the Warrior were around 1,053 vehicles made up of seven different variations, but this number was reduced by 1995 and the British Army had received around 789 Warriors. The first two battalions to be equipped with Warriors were 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, the 1st Battalion Staffordshire Regiment in 1988. Now, the Warrior incorporates several design features in keeping with the UK battlefield experience. In particular, there are no firing ports in the hull, similar to like the BMP series and such, in line with the British thinking that the role of the armoured personnel carrier or infantry fighting vehicle is to carry troops under protection to the objective and then give fire support when they have disembarked. The absence of firing ports also allows for additional applique armour to be fitted to the sides of the vehicle, which invariably applied to Warriors involved in active operations, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. The crew of the Warrior comprises of the driver seated in the front left of the hull and the gunner and commander who are both seated in the turret. The embarked infantry section can number up to seven soldiers who are seating facing each other in the rear hull compartment. Infantry access is through a single electric ram powered to the door at the rear of the hull, rather than a drop down ramp as the American M113 APC and M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. Warrior section vehicles are able to carry and support seven fully equipped soldiers together with supplies and weapons, including specialized weapon sessions such as Milan, Javelin and such, although we don't use Milan anymore. 
Included in a number of different anti-tank weapons that can be used, they can also potentially fit in 50 caliber machine guns or any extra ammunition for the rest of the platoon. This can pretty much cover them for a 48 hour battlefield day, also covered within that are nuclear, biological and chemical conditions. So this vehicle is pretty much able to get infantry in any environment very, very safely. The vehicle is fitted with a two-man GKN Sankey turret and armed with a non-stabilized L21A1 30mm rod and cannon, capable of destroying some APCs at a maximum range of around 1500 meters, and also has a L94A1 EX34 7.62mm Hughes helicopter coaxial machine gun. Holy crap, that's a lot of information for one piece of armament. Um, that really hurt the tongues there in that one. It is fitted with two clusters of four defensive grenade launchers, usually used with the visual and infrared screening smoke screen system, so basically if you need to pop smoke to cover your vehicle, that is available at any time. All Warrior Infantry Section vehicles are equipped with Bowman radios, and only the infantry sections are armed with the 30mm rod and cannon. This is because the other variants are going to utilize the extra space needed for the gun um, for other different systems for... For example, the OPB vehicle, they have different sighting systems to be able to call in artillery better and better viewing uh, than the standard sight system that is used on the infantry variant. However, the other vehicles still do have a dummy cannon in place to kind of show the enemy that this vehicle could be still a 510 variant and still put 30mm rounds in my face. Um, so yeah, it's basically just a fake barrel that's put in place and it's actually quite difficult to tell which kind of variants are which. Uh, one of the easy ways to tell if it's a command variant, i.e. the 515 for the OPV vehicles and such, is they're going to have a hell of a lot more antennas uh, poking off the back of the vehicle than any other sort of infantry section vehicles. Um, as I said before, all vehicles are equipped with Bowman radios to replace the old Klansman radios. And when they were first introduced, the vehicles are fitted with a passive image intensifier or night vision sight. These have actually been replaced now with the Thales Optronics Battle Group Thermal Imaging Sight, otherwise known as BGTI, uh, to upgrade its night firing capabilities with a 8x magnification. And uh, as of 2007, 350 of these vehicles were fitted with BGTI. And they are really good sights, guys, but they are a little dated, and it's nice to see that the Ajax system is bringing in newer, more updated sighting systems for this vehicle. Now the Warrior's much respected speed is down to its Perkins Rolls-Royce V8 Condor engine which produces around 550 brake horsepower. This too is delivered and already constructed for installation at the GKN workshops. Along with its 4 speed fully automatic transmission and hydrostatic drive steering and with improved suspension and lower ground pressure, the Warrior can travel around 75 km an hour on and off road up to around 50 km an hour off road, allowing it to keep up to pace with the British Army's Challenger 2 main battle tank. The vehicle's protection is specific pretty much for the day it was designed. The aluminum armour construction provides protection against 14.5mm armoured piercing rounds, 155mm airburst shell fragments and 9kg of anti-tank mines. The Warrior can be fitted with applique armour in battlefield situations as seen in 2003 for the invasion of Iraq and the Warriors were fitted with cage armour again for both Iraq and Afghanistan. This allows for the defence against the most common and most deadly RPG weapon systems. In Bosnia, a warrior drove over a Serbian anti-tank mine and received very little damage. However, three warriors of the Staffordshire Regiment were destroyed and nine others killed when warriors were mistakenly attacked by American A-10 Thunderbolts firing Maverick missiles. But the warrior can boast that the MBC protection and fully supplied warrior crews can then operate in MBC conditions for quite a long time with all hatches secured, for at least 48 hours. The British Army, along with Lockheed Martin UK Warrior Transformation Team, decided they need to significantly improve the vehicle with new upgrades, including the fitting and integration of a CT-40 weapon system, otherwise known as the 40mm autocannon, an open electric architecture system, and the British Army's Bowman Communication Suite, which basically can communicate with other vehicles and such, which we've seen in the Ajax system, and improved all-round armour protection. The armor solution is a modular applique ceramic system for the turret and a common mounting system for the hull. So various types of armor packs can be rapidly fitted which maximizes soldier protection against specific threats. The mine blast resistant seat subsystem has also successfully been tested in a full scale MOD mine blast test and a series of armor blast and ballistics tests have been confirmed that the new turret affords significantly more protection. 
As Lockheed Martin UK is the turret integration authority for the new Scout SV Ajax system, it's going to use its upgrades and will provide significant synergies for both vehicles including reduced demonstration phase costs through the Warrior Transformation Program, through leveraging of common development systems, so basically kind of utilizing each other's systems, and reducing the training burden needed to pretty much train on these different variants, and reduce logistic and operating costs through the common systems and parts on each different vehicle. For export, the only export of Warrior has been to Kuwait in 1993, who purchased 254 Desert Warrior vehicles fitted with Delco turrets, stabilized M242 25mm chain guns with coaxial 7.62mm chain guns, and two Hughes tow anti-tank guided missile launchers, one mounted on each side. Okay guys, so that's the overview over, and now I'm going to go over just starting the exterior tour of the vehicle and show you some key features. So, first of all, you can clearly see this vehicle is not the same camouflage scheme as the majority of the Warriors you've seen in this video. This is because this vehicle has been sent to British Army Training Unit Suffield, and this particular vehicle is what I would say near immaculate in terms of its paint scheme. It's got very little scratching on damaging, considering that British Army Training Unit Suffield is a very arduous and strenuous exercise for both man and machine. This is actually a really pristine vehicle. Now, this vehicle is actually a 510 variant, so it's an infantry variant, um, unlike the fake barrel placed on the 514 and 515 uh, artillery variants. And we're just going to kind of go over the different sort of bits and pieces that you can see on the side of this vehicle and you kind of get an idea of what's going on. So, first of all, the thing that kind of screams out in front of us straight away is the red and black squares you see on the side of the vehicle. Well, the little red square that you see there that has some actual duct tape placed over the top of it is a little rubber flap that is actually covering a fire extinguisher port. So basically, on the exterior of the vehicle, if you're walking around, you have the ability to set off the internal fire extinguisher system for the vehicle. So you lift up the little rubber hand rubber flap there's a little handle underneath you put your hand in there you grab the handle you twist it and internally there are tubes running all the way through the crew compartments the engine compartment and such and when you pull it it fires horrible horrible tasting and very bad for you fire extinguisher powder putting out the fire hopefully so that's what that little red flap's for and there's also one on the other side of the vehicle too there's also obviously those little red handles all over the vehicle inside. Uh, the big black square I'm going to go on about in a little while here, um, that you see on the right, that's actually a compartment right there. Um, as you can see, just above the red flap is a spare track link, really handy to have. And just to the right is the air filter compartment. So you actually lift open that handle and there is an um, air filter compartment in there that you can actually swap your filters out. Now, as you can see, there are kind of like a tubular outward facing little holes all over the front and the side of the vehicle here. These are not smoke discharges. I've had it before, people saying, well, are they smoke discharges? They fire flares or something? No, they are purely just cam pole holders. It's basically to allow us to put our camouflage netting over the vehicle. We place the cam spreaders and the poles into those little holes, and they are able to spread out the camouflage netting over the vehicle instead of getting caught on everything. The vehicle does have two very large lifting shackles, both at the front and at the very top front of the vehicle. Now, this vehicle is not able to be airlifted, it is far too heavy, but these shackles do help a lot when trying to recover the vehicle quickly. Uh, we can get a crane on the front, hook it up to those two towing pintles, lift her up nice and high and be able to get access to the underside of the belly and such. It's really handy to have. They are big, heavy-duty shackles too, so they're, they're really handy to have. Um, as you can see, the driver's hatch is now classed as half hatch. Uh, it can go full hatch or fully open. Obviously, being if the turret is spinning around, if it is fully open hatch, it is unable to do so. So there is a safety feature in place to stop that from happening, but sometimes it doesn't work, and the barrel can slam into that driver's hatch, as shown in this video. Yes, yes, that was me in my early days of being a crew member on the Warriors, is trying to get the turret to go to the front, and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could stick my camera on the end of the barrel, look pretty cool whilst I'm in the workshop. 
spun around, forgot to close the driver's hatch. Luckily enough, guys, everything was fine. It all got checked out by armor and nothing was damaged. I got a good old slap wrist for that one, I could tell you that much. Uh, never do that again. But, you know, you make the mistake once and it'll never happen again, hopefully. So, yeah, it, de <laughs> it definitely does have um, something you've got to be careful of when you've got your driver's hatch there. Uh, the cowling you see to the left of the driver's hatch is actually there to prevent uh, water buildup and uh, basically junk and debris to be sucked in through the top louvers into the engine bay. Uh, the engine bay is obviously located to the right of the driver's section uh, and basically the bulkhead gets extremely hot. In Afghanistan, I'm not going to lie to you, it's one of the hottest environments I've ever been in my life as a driver of this vehicle. Uh, it was so bloody hot because you've got an engine, 550 horsepower engine running beside you and you're sat in your driver's spot just cooking beside that bulkhead. Um, so yeah, really, really, uh, really hot when it gets, uh, when it gets going. Um, we'll go around the other side and I'll show you the other uh, sort of engine related stuff a little later on here. Um, but let's keep rolling then and head uh, further down the vehicle. So as you can see we're looking at the running gear of the vehicle here and uh, just above the running gear in the track is actually a rubber flap which is basically kind of a mud guard for the vehicle. They're a real pain in the ass, they always get ripped off, they never get looked after. As I said before, this one is pretty much immaculate, it's looking really, really good. There's that air filter uh, compartment there, it flips open, it can be quite dangerous if you don't uh, lift it open properly. To pull your air boxes out and to smash them out with all that dust in Afghanistan and Iraq, they had uh, real problems trying to clean out that system, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, trying to get the uh, dust particles out there. That's actually our NBC compartment that we just looked at there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So we're looking at the running gear here, final drive to the front, as you can see by this r large red plate here, this is actually where the final drive drive uh, attachment can actually be split. Basically the little red plate can be slipped up, the uh, cap that covers the hole where the uh, spline would come out can be removed, and then you insert a rod to actually pull the spline out and separate the drive line from the power pack so the power pack can actually be lifted out. Uh, the little cap you see just below that is the filling point for the final drive, and to the left is just the sprockets and the labyrinth that allow the tracks to obviously be pulled along on the final drive. This is a front drive line, so it's actually pulling the track forward. So a lot of armored fighting vehicles are obviously going that way instead of the rear uh, drive train that's used on obviously main battle tanks and such. And uh, it's really quite a simple system to try and get the uh, the power pack out really in terms of splitting the final drive. It's actually really nice and handy. Uh, sometimes we have to use to put it into neutral gear and give it a little bit of a wiggle left and right to get that spline drive in there, but eventually it would slip in and out quite nicely. Moving on then, you can see that we have two hydraulic suspension damper units along with another four torsional bar systems. So basically the front two uh, stations are hydraulically controlled, uh, really nice spongy soft suspension which is nice to have and the rest are all just standard torsional bar. There are six uh, wheel stations on this vehicle along with a top roller and rear idler wheel which you're going to see any minute here. A uh, very reliable running gear to be honest never had much of an issue. That's our uh, track tensioning system to be able to put pressure on the back idler to get that track nice and tight so we don't throw it because that's the last thing you want to have happen when you're really cold and really tired and you have to go out and try and track bash. Uh, some extra storage compartments at the back here, obviously a fantastic little license plate. The buttons that you see here are for the rear door and the emergency stop and there's our hydraulic ram that actually closes the door and the emergency power to that door so the infantry don't get crushed. And there is also an emergency backup panel to actually allow the door to be opened and a rear view sight hatch to be able to see if the infantry are about to get out into a death trap. Um, the vehicle has a lot of room in the back. Unfortunately, I can't film the inside of the vehicle due to, uh, obviously, control issues in terms of uh, secrets and such. So there's the e buttons again, the open and close for the uh, infantry to utilize to allow the commander and the driver and the infantry to get that door open nice and safe. And the door power on off switch. Basically, the door cannot be operated by the driver in his compartment without that switch being powered to on. That's to prevent the boys getting their arms and legs chopped off as they get in and out. Uh, there is also some travelling handles there that can actually uh, be placed down to stop any try and nasty people trying to get inside and override that system to open the back door. As I said before, there is seven uh, crew, uh, sorry, seven infantry soldiers that are able to be placed in the back of that vehicle. Big old towing shackles at the back again to uh, get us out in any tricky situations. Some back stowage bins that always get filled up with dust. It's really not fun. The cage you see at the top there was basically just to put our cam nets in. There's the full running gear as you see. There's also a uh, damper suspension system at the back for number six station. So that's actually if you go in reverse, you still have that full uh, suspension. There's our exhaust duct just to the front there, uh, shown 
to the front right, uh, the large duct is obviously where the exhaust is going to be pummeling out from. There's our smoke discharges on the top of the vehicle there too, uh, four on each side, so eight in total. And our cannon just in the center along with our coaxial mounted 7.62 machine gun. And basically guys, that is the kind of overview on the exterior of the vehicle then. So now I'm going to talk about my personal experiences with this vehicle and honestly guys I can't express to you enough how much I love this vehicle. It's one of those vehicles where you can say I'm going to trust my life in it and I have trusted my life in it and it's done me very proud. Um, it's protected me on operational tours in Afghanistan um, which is where it was utilized for my uh, sort of most intense moments of using this vehicle. and. Honestly, in terms of driving this thing off-road, it just goes anywhere you want it to go. It drives all over the place, it has no real control issues, no struggles, no struggles with power. Even when you're towing another warrior behind you in the recovery variant that we see right now, uh, which was primarily the vehicle that I was utilizing, um, just fantastic. I mean, the power that that engine produces to pull that kind of weight is incredible. Um, so performance wise it just it really did fantastically in terms of repair which obviously primarily that's what I was doing very simple system to work with the equipment that you utilize to pull the power pack out the way that everything's quite modular the way that everything's quick release it was just really nice to have as I mentioned before the running gear was nice and easy to, to split down and to work with um, in terms of protection I mean we had up armored packages on the warrior we had our chopper armor and such and bar armor no real major concerns um, obviously there were obviously some issues uh, with IEDs in Afghanistan but uh, that's gonna be expected when you're putting armored fighting vehicles against explosive packages that are, you know, three or four times the explosive firepower that these vehicles are designed to deal with, they still hold their own and they just really are very impressive in terms of what they can actually hold back. Um, it's a shame really that uh, the Warrior has kind of been left so late, I find, in terms of getting its upgrade. I really do feel that the upgrade should have come a lot sooner than they are just coming into the light now with the 40mm Bofa cannon. Um, it would have been nice to have that being able to be implemented a lot sooner. Uh, the battle group thermal imaging system, although I really enjoyed working with it, it definitely has some room for improvement. It is nice to also see the battlefield management system coming in now, and they're actually able to start communicating with other vehicles on the battlefield, because I really do think it's time that we start getting down with the modern day battlefield systems that are out there and being able to work as a battle group properly. I mean, we used to have the battle group system with the computers. They never worked, they never were logged in, they were never set up via GPS, and they just didn't work. And it would have been nice to be able to have those systems on the Warrior Works so you can see where the rest of the battle group is. Um, in terms of keeping up with the battle group, this vehicle, if anything, would be the leader of all the vehicles. I don't know how the Ajax performs, I've never seen the Ajax uh, in first hand or even been inside it or whatever, but I know the Warrior is tip, pretty much the tip of the spear, nearly over the Challenger 2. They say the Challenger 2 is fast, no, this thing is nearly double as fast. I mean, whatever you see on paper and specifications is fantastic. I know firsthand how these vehicles travel. Warrior will always outbeat Challenger 2. It is fast, it is nippy, has a beautiful turning circles, uh, easy to turn, easy to maneuver. Um, it's not tillers, so you're not using um, manual turning, you're using purely an automatic gearbox to allow you to adjust steering. Pretty much a driving driving handles, which is just really nice, like a kind of miniature steering wheel. Um, very, very handy to have. And overall, guys, I just think this vehicle has so much potential even for the future. It would be nice to see what kind of armor upgrades they're going to give this vehicle. Uh, clearly, it's held its own, and the name says it all. It is a warrior. It has been through every British Army modern conflict that has been out there since this vehicle has been designed, and it has held its own. It's done the job that's been required of it, and it's going to continue doing so, I hope, for a very, very long time. Anyway guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please, please, please leave a like and a comment and I'd love to hear your opinion on this vehicle. And uh, I hope to see you on the next review of Armored Fighting Vehicles. Thank you so much. Feel free to share on Facebook. All the best and bye-bye.